This video is for all designated responsible federal officials in the NRCS Pacific Islands area. Responsible federal officials are designated by the director and include all district conservationists, the assistant directors for field offices east and west, and the area resource conservationists. Completion of this training is required for responsible federal officials. The NRCS CPA 52 was updated in 2013 and officially adopted by NRCS PIA, and therefore all RFOs must take this training. Any new PIA RFO must also complete this training before they can officially sign off on the CPA 52. Let's begin by looking at a sample CPA 52 that was filled out by the National Office as an example for a cropland conservation plan for EQIP. It might be a good idea to give the spreadsheet a quick look over to make sure that all the text is readable. Some people type long paragraphs but don't enlarge the cells and text is hidden. This can be very frustrating as a reviewer and slow down or distract you from the reviewing process. In addition to readability issues during the review process, hidden text will not print correctly. If the form is hard to read, has hidden text, or takes too much work to do a thorough review, send it back to the planner for cleanup. When you're reviewing a CPA 52, first look to see that the client's name has been properly filled out and the conservation plan identification is in there, whatever that may be. It may be a contract number, or an application number, or a conservation plan number. If this is for a program application, the program authority may be noted. This is an optional section, but can be a good reference for the findings in Section Q or for deciding who should ultimately review this document. For example, CRP or GRP programs are under FSA, and they are the agency who should be making the findings. For CTA, the planner may have put in CTA or left it blank. For program applications such as EQIP, WRP, AMA, etc., the planner may have put in the program name. It is up to you as the reviewer to decide if you need that information or not. In this case, the planner put in EQIP. Next, review to see that any identification related to the farm or property is included, such as the farm, tract, field number, etc. Planners may use TMKs for the Hawaii portion of the Pacific Islands area or any other information that identifies the site and the planning area. In this example, they use the name of the farm, the tract number, which fields are included, and the total number of acres. You then want to see if the client's objectives are stated clearly. This should be a summary of why the client needs or wants a conservation plan. It does not need to be an extensive write-up. It can be as simple as, the farmer wants to increase their profits on their coffee farm, or the cooperator needs a grubbing and grading permit, or the rancher wants healthier cows, or in this example, reduce field maintenance, improve yield and profitability. It should be simple but complete. You then want to review the need for action. This is a summary of the resource problems, those identified by the inventory and evaluation steps of the planning process. Again, simple but complete is best. This should not be a project description or another summary of what the cooperator wants to do. It's just a summary of the resource problems on that client's farm that need to be addressed to reach the client's objectives or purpose. All resource problems identified in the resource and evaluation portion of the planning process should be listed in Section F. If a resource problem will show up due to the installation or management of a conservation practice, it should be added to the list even though it does not currently exist. Usually this will be a short-term problem which will also need to be analyzed and documented. All resource problems listed should be identified and describe the benchmark conditions or existing conditions on the farm at the time of the inventory and evaluation portion of the planning. Those that show up due to practice implementation may be documented as not present in the benchmark or existing conditions. If a tool such as Russell 2, WEPS, WinPST, the Wildlife Habitat Assessment Guide, or any other tool is available, the results generated by that tool should be used. If not, a short written description of the problem should be given, stating what the current condition of the resource concern is on the property. Evaluations should be quantified where possible using available NRCS tools. Those can be either from the FOTG 
or from our technical notes or any other tool that is made available to the planner for the planning process. You can see in this example, sheet and real erosion was identified in fields 1 through 3 and they used Russell 2 to come up with 9 tons per acre per year. Concentrated flow was identified in the form of ephemeral gullies in fields 1 and 2 and they did a calculated volume to determine 43 tons per acre per year. Also, classic gullies were identified on this property in field 3 at about 68 tons per acre per year, also using a calculated value. In this example, if you go further down, there is also soil quality degradation compaction, and they figured out that the rooting depth was restricted at 4 inches by using a soil probe. Further down, you can see that under plants, degraded plant condition, undesirable plant productivity and health, there is no tool to give a benchmark or existing condition. The planner describes the current productivity and compares that with the expected productivity and states the source of that data. There are more in this example, but I won't go over each of them. As a reviewer of the CPA 52, though, you should review all resource concerns listed and make sure they are properly documented. As a reviewer of the CPA 52, you should be aware of what tools are available to the planners in coming up with the benchmark conditions and decide whether or not they have used the proper tool and put in the proper information to give the baseline or benchmark conditions for the resource concerns that are identified. At this time, it is probably a good idea to go up and check to make sure that the Need for Action section, E, does include all of the identified resource problems that are listed under section F of the CPA 52 and also vice versa. Those problems that are identified in the need for action should also be listed in section F under the resource concerns and their corresponding benchmark conditions should be noted. Short-term effects that are the result of practice implementation should not be included in the need for action section because they don't currently exist as a resource problem but will only show up during construction or installation and hopefully be eliminated during operation and maintenance of that practice. In other words, installation related resource problems that do not currently exist on site should be listed under section F but not in section E. Review the human, economic, and social considerations to make sure that what is included is logical, quantitative, or adequately descriptive and appropriate. Don't forget to make sure to check the special environmental concerns under Section G. These should be documented at the same time that the typical soil, water, air, plants, animals, and energy resource concerns are documented. All of these special environmental concerns need to be reviewed. If the concern is not present, then the benchmark condition needs to state that. A reference to the information source should be given. In many cases, this will be a GIS layer or FOTG document or other such source. None of these sections under any of the special environmental concerns should be empty. If the concern is not present, it should say why it is not present by saying, for example, no non-attainment areas are present in the planning area and where that information came from. As you can see in this example, under every special environmental concern, there is something that says whether the situation exists or not. Coral reefs not present in planning area. But under the Clean Water Act in this example, within 0.2 miles of the planning area, there's Rock Creek, adjacent to Field 4, and they use the USGS quad map. They also found out that that is a 303D listed stream for bacteria and oxygen levels and noted that in the benchmark condition. So when you are reviewing the CPA 52 the planner has completed, make sure benchmark conditions are filled out for every one of these special environmental concerns. And you want to make sure that it does say where that information came from, such as the FOTG section, the maps that were used, the GIS layers or other such sources of information, including websites if that's appropriate. Once you've reviewed the resource concerns and benchmark conditions and the special environmental concerns and their benchmark conditions, you can go back up to the section H, the alternative section, to see how these things will be addressed in the conservation plan. The alternatives should be a summary of what actions will be taking place. The no action alternative must be completed. It should not be left blank and it should be a description of how the cooperator plans to manage the property in the foreseeable future and or what actions are planned to be implemented.
This may include actions under previous conservation plans or contracts. It should not be another summary of resource problems, nor should it be an effects analysis, such as soil will continue to erode. The no action alternative provides the basis for comparison of all other alternatives and justifies NRCS proposed actions. Alternative 1 and or 2 should be a list of the planned conservation practices recommended to address the client's documented resource problems. A list of practice names and codes is adequate, but keep in mind that there may be different ways to install a practice. Fence, for example, may be woven wire, electric, barbed, etc., and the installation method may have different effects on the resource concerns or special environmental concerns. It is up to the reviewer to decide if enough information is included in this section. Again, it should not be a summary of the resource problems. It should not be an analysis of the resource problems. It should be a list of practices that will address the resource problems to planning criteria or reaching planning criteria. A resource management system, or RMS alternative, is no longer required under the National Planning Procedures Handbook. If one is included, though, it should be marked as such using the checkbox. The RMS alternative project description must address all identified resource problems to planning criteria. You can see in the example that was given by the National Office that the alternative that they came up with is also an RMS alternative. Section I is the effects of the alternatives, where the effects to the environment are documented. What happens to the resource concerns when all of the practices recommended in the alternative are installed? For each identified resource problem, the corresponding cells under the described alternative must be completed. Use the difference from the benchmark condition as the basis for the effects after the proposed actions have been installed. All practices combined, how are they affecting the resource concern? That's what should be in this section. Analysis of each alternative should be completed as if the alternative would be applied. The no action and non-selected alternative, if there is one, should be analyzed to the same degree as the selected alternative. Both short and long-term effects should be included. If, for example, installing a structure causes short-term sheet and rill erosion, but the long-term cessation of sheet and rill erosion, both effects should be included under that alternative. Refer regularly to the alternatives description to evaluate the appropriateness of the effects analysis. Often the effects under the no action alternative will not change or get worse by X amount. You can see in the example that we're reviewing that the sheet and real erosion under the no action alternative where the client continues to do corn, soybean, wheat rotation with conventional tillage and nutrient application that their soil loss will stay at 9 tons per acre per year. But if they apply all of these practices, then sheet and real erosion will be reduced to 4 tons per acre per year. Similarly, the ephemeral gully problem will stay the same at 43 tons per acre per year under the no action alternative, but will go down to 0 tons per acre per year under the proposed alternative. The classic gully in this example will increase 30 tons per acre per year more with a 5 feet per year increase. I guess of the head cut, if the client continues to perform the same activities that they perform currently. But with the proposed alternative, the classic gully erosion is reduced to zero tons per acre per year because the head cuts are eliminated and the slopes are stabilized. Under undesirable plant productivity and vigor, the planner shows what the expected yield will be based on the current no action or proposed alternative one activities. Just saying productivity will increase or the problem will decrease is not adequate. As a reviewer, you need to see the data that supports your ultimate findings, so you may want to ask the planner for more information if it is not provided to your satisfaction. This is what you're looking for. You want to make sure the planner has put in the information that shows, again, the benchmark conditions, what is currently is at, based on the tool or the verbiage that describes the current condition. What will happen if the client continues to farm or manage the land the way they do? That's the no action alternative. And what will happen if the suite of practices that are proposed are installed? How will there be a change, an increase or decrease, both short and long term, of that resource concern? Again, using the tools to use the numbers if that tool is available for that particular resource concern. 
This section should not list the practices or the installation methods. That information is for these alternative descriptions up here and here. This section is to document the expected change from benchmark, how it changes from the existing conditions. If the alternative does not address the identified resource concern to planning criteria, the checkbox must be checked. The RMS alternative will not have any check in that checkbox under the not meet planning criteria column. So when you are reviewing this, if an alternative is marked as an RMS plan under section H, the no box under that alternative should be checked under this check if not meet planning criteria column. If there is anything that is checked because it does not meet planning criteria, then that alternative is not an RMS alternative. The same information should be reviewed under the Special Environmental Concerns section. Section J is the impacts to the Special Environmental Concerns. Again, for both the no action and any alternative that's described, there needs to be some analysis. If the benchmark condition for the Special Environmental Concerns shows that the concern is not present in the planning area, and that's documented as to where that information came from, then the planner can type in NA or not applicable under these sections. Right now, there's only a choice of no effect or may affect under the drop-down boxes. This is a change from previous versions of the CPA 52. The no effect should only be used if that condition is known to be in the area. And this is an example of the Clean Water Act where you've got a creek 0.2 miles from the planning area that is considered waters of the U.S., also a 303D listed stream. Under the no action alternative, there is no effect because there are no actions planned that result in the discharge of dredged or fill material. There is also no effect under the situation under the alternative 1 because again, no actions are planned that result in dredge or discharge of fill material. And also, the planned actions reduce nutrients, pathogens, and sediments entering the stream. This planner decided that this was still a no effect. You may choose to agree with that or disagree with that. Some reviewers may feel that an improvement to water quality is an effect. Others may not. If you agree with it, just continue with your review. If not, ask the planner to change the form or explain their decision. Again, if the special environmental concern is not present in the planning area, it needs to state so in the benchmark conditions and say not applicable under the appropriate alternative. None of the cells in this section, unless there's a blank alternative, should be blank. If there's a may affect determination, the planner needs to state why it may affect. In this case, there's bat habitat in the riparian area for listed species. They do an improvement in wetland and riparian condition with field border practice that results in increased riparian forest canopy and improved bat habitat. Because it's a may affect, there's a need for further consultation in this case with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so they marked that there is a need for further action. You want to make sure that those are checked or not checked as appropriate when you're doing this review. When you're doing this review, no effect or may affect means that the special environmental concern is in the area. Not applicable means that it is not in the planning area. Blank is incorrect. There should never be a blank. The only time a blank is allowed is if there is an alternative that has not been completed or proposed. In this example, there are only two proposed alternatives, the no action, the farmer continues to do what they normally do, and the RMS alternative that is proposed by NRCS, without another alternative for the client to choose from. As you know, there are guide sheets available for planners. If they do use a guide sheet to come up with a determination of no effect or may affect, and they refer to that guide sheet, they need to say see attached guide sheet and you'll know which one that is because it's under this special environmental concern. If another document is used to document the effect, then those can be referenced in this section as well. And that guide sheet and other reference needs to be attached to the electronic or printed version of the CPA 52 since they are important documents that show the decision or the reason for the decision. If not physically attached, they should be readily available in the plan or contract file. Review section K to be sure that it has been filled out correctly. 
This section should list any necessary easements, permissions, or permits required to implement the alternatives. For example, the Clean Water Act Section 404, Rivers and Harbor Act Section 110, Endangered Species Act Section 10 or Section 7, State and County Building Permits, Water Rights Documentation, etc. Chances are, under the No Action Alternative, that cell will be left blank. If any other people are contacted in the development of this plan, any outside agencies such as DLNR, DOFA, DAWR, American Samoa EPA, or whoever, then the planner should note here who was contacted and information that was received from them. The planner can refer to their CON 6 or planner notes if appropriate and readily accessible. If any consultation, formal or informal, is needed with another agency, that should also be listed under here. And in this case, the concurrence was attached, so I don't know why that was checked up above with a checkbox. Because the NLAA concurrence has been received, that check in the box up above under ESA here should actually be removed. So you want to make sure that those are correct. Again, those checks mean that something is not completed yet. When there is no check in the box, then it is all completed. In this case, the concurrence for an NLAA is attached, therefore no further action is needed. And so before you sign this as the RFO, you should make sure that is fixed. The cumulative effects narrative should be reviewed. I know most people tend to leave this blank. It's best if they don't. You want to make sure the planner has considered what happens in the general area of the plan. In the case of this particular one, if the farmer continues to farm the way they are, with the crop rotation system, etc., they continue to contribute to water quality degradations through nutrients and sediment and turbidity additions to Rock Creek downstream of the planting area. It might be outside of the planting area, but they are contributing, so that is a cumulative effect. Under the proposed alternative, combined with other conservation actions in the watershed, water quality is expected to improve. Now you can see that this doesn't have to have specific quantitative information. It can be a general idea of what will happen in the area cumulatively with what the farmer is planning to do along with their neighbors or the local municipalities or whatever the case may be. If mitigation actions are required, then that needs to be recorded in Section L. Again, most likely under the No Action Alternative, that will be left blank. If notes are used, like the floodplain guide sheet in this case, those can be referred to or the concurrence letter to the not likely to adversely affect should have been added here because those are mitigations. Those are things that are being done to reduce the effect of the action on the environment. Most common in the Pacific Islands area are the results of ESA Section 7 or Cultural Resource Section 106 reviews or consultations. So for example, trees will not be cut down from this time period to that time period, or work will not be done during the nesting season of this species or that species or something will be done to avoid the harm that may be done to cultural resources, such as clearing by hand, not disturbing the soil, and not by machine in a culturally sensitive area. If the details are spelled out in the attached or reference document, there's no need to rewrite them here. Section M must be filled out. There must be a record of what the client has chosen to do. They can continue to do what they're doing and not bother to implement or follow a conservation plan, in which case it would be the no action alternative. Chances are, if this is related to a contract or application for financial assistance, the selected alternative will be whatever is covered by that contract. You do need to review and make sure the planner has put in why the client has chosen that alternative. And again, this doesn't need to be a long, extensive write-up, but a description of why the client chose this. In this case, it's fairly simple. The alternative meets the majority of resource concerns identified and is economically feasible for the client. Actually, it meets them all because this is considered an RMS alternative, so that should be meets all of the resource concerns identified. As a reviewer, that's what you want to look for. Make sure the wording does reflect all of the information that is up above. You're looking for consistency throughout this document because this is a record of NRCS's decision-making process. Section N is a note of the context that was used in making the analysis. There are pull-downs here. I'm not sure why the person who filled this out put in three different categories, but they decided that the context is just for fields one through four in the Rock Creek watershed in Deer County. 
Some people choose this to use as following the three alternatives and use the pull downs to state it would be local, regional, national, etc. However you choose to have your planners do that is up to you. But there needs to be something in here so that you, as a reviewer, and any outside reviewer, will know what context that this analysis was done under. In this case, the context is really only on the farm itself, so it would be considered local. The planner then should have completed section O. This is the determination of significance or extraordinary circumstances. Review this. Make sure that all these are answered correctly with yes or no. I know people tend to just fill this in with a no answer, but do be aware of what these questions are, and if you agree with the answers as the RFO that is going to be signing this, you do want to make sure that the proper person has signed the form. If it is a non-NRCS person who filled out the CPA 52, the CPA 52 needs to be reviewed by an NRCS staff person who has verified that the information is accurate. So if a TSP signs this, an NRCS person also needs to sign it. If this is done by an NRCS planner, then that planner signs it and gives their title and the date of their signature. Now we can and do fill these out for other agencies. For FSA, for example, say for CREP or GRP or some other program that they are actually in charge of, but an NRCS planner is filling out the CPA 52 for them because NRCS developed the conservation plan. If this is being done and is not an NRCS federal action and we do not have control or responsibility over this proposed alternative and this CPA 52 is shared with someone other than the client, then the planner needs to put down who this is being provided to. And that would be, for example, FSA or RD or whoever it might be. For going outside of USDA, make sure the client's permission to share the information is documented in writing. Review the notes section below to see what other information the planner has provided. In this case, they used this section to explain what the acronyms used in the main portion of the CPA 52 actually stand for. Just review this to make sure it is all appropriate. Make sure all the attachments that are referred to in the CPA 52 are attached or readily accessible in the Conservation Planner contract file. From here on, it is up to you as the responsible federal official to fill out the remainder of the CPA 52. This is where you need to start documenting your decisions as a representative of USDA NRCS Pacific Islands area. Sometime the planner has filled this in for you. If they do, make sure they've done it correctly or ask your planners to not do this because this is where you are documenting your decisions based on the details and environmental analysis that was done by the planner and reviewed by you. I won't go over Section Q in detail. It is up to you to decide which is the appropriate finding for the plan you are reviewing. Once you've decided which one of these five you choose, you need to say why you made that decision in Section R. So if you choose one, not a federal action, you need to say why it is not a federal action. If you choose two, all the proposed activities are covered by categorical exclusions and there are no extraordinary circumstances, you need to use the pull-down option and list all those categorical exclusions that are needed. Once you've made your finding and everything is completed, all the permits are in place, all the required consultations are completed and documented, basically all the checkboxes are removed from the Needs Further Action portion in Section J, then you can sign this as complete. You are signing for the director as their designee. You are putting your name on the record stating that you have considered the effects of the alternatives on the resource concerns, economic and social considerations, special environmental concerns, and extraordinary circumstances as defined by USDA and RCS, the agency, by regulation and policy, and have made your finding as documented. Sign your name, put in your title, and date. Keep in mind that your signature may or may not be the final act in reference to the CPA 52. If the conservation plan changes significantly, or the client chooses to follow a different conservation alternative, or there is a major modification to a contract associated with the plan, the CPA 52 needs to be updated to reflect these modifications. This is because the action alternative will no longer be correctly described. If you do a major mod and you drop one or two of these practices, those dropped practices no longer address the resource concerns that they were meant to address. In this case, it would no longer be an RMS alternative, and the results of the analysis will change. Less soil erosion reduction, for example. 
But in general, once you sign this as a responsible federal official, it should be kept in the client's files, either the conservation plan or contract file, as a documentation of NRCS's decision and how those decisions were reached. If you have any questions on how to review a CPA 52 as a responsible federal official, please feel free to contact me through your area office staff. I'm happy to answer your questions and help you in any way I can. By having completed this training, you are now allowed to sign the CPA 52 as a responsible federal official as designated by the director of the NRCS Pacific Islands area.